Welcome to uh, Level Up with Yellow Dig. Today we're going to be doing a uh, data informed teaching. And uh, if I can make my slide go, uh, we're going to introduce. Well, let's let's introduce ourselves first. Um, so I'm Bob Erdischek. I'm Yellow Dig's head of client success. Been with Yellow Dig for uh, almost three years. Um, love it here. I used to teach a long time ago, uh, for a long time actually, and uh, never found quite the white tool to to really spark better student experience until I found Yellow Dig, and now I love to work with our partners to help them get the most out of it. I'm joined today by uh, our Vice President of Academic Product Engagement, Brian Verdine. Brian? Hi, everyone. Um, just so you know, my background is all in psychology and education. I uh, got my PhD from Vanderbilt, uh, went to do a postdoc at the University of Delaware, um, and while I was there, I started getting into ed tech because I was really interested in applying a lot of the things that I was learning. Um, so I, I shifted. Uh, I, I've been working with Yellow Dig for about four and a half years now. Um, I've done a lot of the research on the platform or worked with our partners as they've been doing that research. Um, so part of what I'm going to present today is a little bit on that research before we get into um, how you can use some of the data that we're providing and uh, really looking forward to helping everybody get the, the best out of Yellow And last but not least, we have a success manager, Janine Galligan, who is joining us here. Um, Janine today is going to be uh, managing the chat and the Q&A, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Janine, if you want to just give a really brief intro. Good morning, everybody. As Bob introduced me, I'm one of the success managers on his team, and I come to Yellow Dig after working in higher education for over 20 years, teaching communication classes, and I got to use Yellow Dig before I in one of in several of the classes. So I'm always excited about talking about Yellow Dig. Nice to meet you all. All right, um, and so. Uh, these, you know, maybe you can't ca caught some of these previous sessions. I believe that if for some reason you weren't able to catch these wonderful sessions uh, in our Level Up series, they are available um, probably on YouTube, and we can also share them with you if you're if you'd like to know more. Um, but here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to give, you know, we did the overview. Brian is going to share our story and 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 and, and how data informed sort of the design of Yellow Dig and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and then we'll go through some of the ways in the platform that you as instructors can use Yellow Dig data and, and content to inform your teaching. We do have a lot to cover today. So we're going to ask um, for your patience with answering questions. Obviously, Janine will be there to answer what she can in the chat and uh, perhaps refer some of them up to us if they're relevant and, and quick, but we do have a number of things to cover. We're hoping at the end that there is more time for questions. And uh, if you had any specific questions that you submitted when you when you signed up for 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 this, um, we, we saw that a lot of those questions were not specifically related to this topic, but we would be more than happy, Janine and I and, and our success team, to meet with you to discuss those uh, further. Um, so please uh, reach out and Janine, maybe you can put our email addresses in the chat if anyone wants to do that. And we'll try to revisit those questions uh, as well as we're going. All right. So without further ado. Brian Verdine, let us know, you know, what 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 was the early days of Yellow Dig like and, and, and what were we trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, early on, I think, you know, Yellow Dig has always um, been focused around the idea of um, helping students interact with one another and with their instructor to, you know, improve learning outcomes. And one of the places that we saw an opportunity for improvement was, you know, in sort of the discussion board area. And early on, as we were building the product, um, we allowed things like the creation of a separate board for every um, learning management system assignment, and we could pass back grades from those separate discussion areas. And, and you know, as we were working with faculty, a lot of them were asking to do that or, or were setting up their, um, you know, systems naturally that way. And, and we, you know, encouraged it, frankly, at first. We we assumed pretty discussion boards really would work, meaning if you, you know, take a modern social media influence platform that students are going to feel comfortable engaging in and, you know, put it into a, a, a learning uh, situation that students would like it better um, and they would, would still be able to learn quite a bit from that. And uh, we also thought, you know, there are clear benefits to instructors carefully prompting their students and focusing them on topics 
um, directing traffic a little bit. We also thought that, um, you know, with our point system that uh, encouraging posts was the um, most likely way to get students to participate, right? Yeah, and we're talking about posts versus comments, right? Posts versus comments, yeah. Right, so we're, we were we're encouraging posts. Yeah, so so we set the point system up originally to give more points for posts, and that's what we sort of recommended. Um, and, you know, part of our reason for thinking that that was the right way to go, too, is that most professors, when they were grading discussion, you know, boards, were only grading the posts anyway. So so, so um, what, what so changed, Brian? Yeah, what changed is uh, we kind of, we basically realized that all of those hypotheses seem to be wrong, or at least questionable. Um, what we found from comparing the bucketed discussions in our own technology with more open discussions um, is that the, the discussions that were more segmented had much lower student participation. Instructors participated less. They generally didn't you know, enjoy the experience as much. Um, we, we saw less improvements in student retention. Um, more more support problems, especially a lot of students, you know, complaining that the, you know, something blocked them out of getting into yellow dig or whatever. Um, and basically just on every level, we, we found that more open discussions produced better outcomes, both in terms of participation and learning. So, so basically a prompted discussion is a prompted discussion wherever it resides. Yes, I mean it's. It seems like just having a nicer experience is was not sort of propelling the outcomes that we really expected. Um, and I just want to cover a little bit of the data that we based that on. It's, it's not nearly all of it, but um, some of that came from you know an institutional pilot we did where where they literally A B tested the two things, um, either having simultaneous board or or unique board per discussion, and basically we saw a 60 to 70 percent lift just from putting the same prompted discussion inside of one single scrolling community and that was the direct a b test same students same courses so instead of the weekly uh, graded assignment it was it was one continuous assignment. it was one continuous community where all of the topics you know all of the discussion questions were being answered in the same area um you know, some other research we've done are on things like word count. So, um, you know, a lot of instructors want students to write really long, detailed, thoughtful posts. And so they would turn the word count up. And what we were finding is um, you might get students to produce the posts, um, but other students don't read the really long posts. And those long posts tended to have more filler in them than necessarily high quality. And so what we found um, pretty quickly was that much shorter posts and comments um, tend to be better for overall engagement, but it also tends to increase the quality and the quality of the responses because students will say what they need to say uh, and then not, you know, waste a whole lot of, of text and, and it leads to better actual back and forth conversations. People are reading what each other produce. Yeah. yeah. Um, some other things we based that on, uh, this is examples from one instructor that ran Yellow Dig with a really large class uh, at the University of Florida semester after semester. Uh, we stopped tracking this data a while ago, but um, uh, he's still using the platform. We could probably reconstruct this to extend it out to today. But um, basically he started with the recommendations that we had and the capabilities we had in the platform. So he, uh, you know, valued posts higher than comments. Uh, we didn't have the social points categories at all, so you couldn't get points for comments on posts or reactions at that time. And what we see is, is that that leads to a really low conversation ratio. So students go there, they post, they mostly do what they need to do, but they're not really talking that much about stuff. They're not really interacting with one another. So in a lot of ways, that situation is not checking the box that people are adding um, yellow dig to their courses for. And then what we found uh, over time, and he's experimented on his own with this, and, and you know, as we work with partners and look at what they're doing, these are some of the things that we learned, but um, as he added more value for comments, and we added the ability to put social points onto, um, uh, onto the point system, uh, students really start talking to one another a lot more, 
And as it turns out, we see as a clear pattern or platform, the more students actually interact with one another, the more likely they are to participate above and beyond the requirements, more likely to participate thoughtfully and really um, you know, get out of it what we want. Um, Bob's good. Yeah. So um, uh, well, the final thing that we really found, or one of the other things that we really found, was that as you improve conversation and get students to listen more, uh, learning outcomes tend to improve. And so this was this, uh, from a study where they looked at um, course grade outcomes relative to yellow behaviors. And the thing that always surprises people, I think, is that the most highly related thing was how many um, reactions students gave out to other people's posts. And the reason that they, you know, thought that that relationship was there is because students are consuming the information that's being posted. They're putting reactions on posts that they find valuable. The more a student reads and the more they find valuable, the more they're going to learn. Yeah, they, they're not going to be putting reactions on posts and comments that they haven't read. Yep. So what we find in our platform is that a lot of the things that are most predictive of learning are actually um, those things that would, would indicate the student is consuming the information that's being posted. Um, and so that led, led for us as a company to really shift our focus from, from you know, creating a better discussion experience to deciding that we really needed in order to solve the student interaction and instructor and student interaction you know, problems that are, are kind of in that format to really build something that looks more like what is on the right hand side here where students are allowed to bring their own topics, they're allowed to ask questions. You know, we try to eliminate deadlines so that students come in more continuously throughout and really have time to interact with one another. You don't get those like spikes of, of procrastination um, and a lot of activity in a very short amount of time. Um, because when students are doing that, they're not really reading each other's stuff. They're not really interacting with one another. They're just posting stuff onto a board and uh, waiting for the professor to grade it. Yeah, that, that's really it. Yep. So, so you know, this is the data that kind of formed that shift, and and what we see is that when people make that shift, there really is a pretty big wow of a difference, and it, I think it's largely because students are buying into the value of this. Right? They want to be able to just talk about some of these topics. They want to be able to interact with students, but the framework of a standard discussion uh, sort of interrupts a lot of that. Um, yeah, they, they have to do what the professor wants, and, and there's little agency, if any, to, to bring out what they need and, and, and what they're interested in. Before you go to the next slide, Bob, the one thing I want to point out about this, because I think it's fascinating, is that, um, you know, as you adopt best practices, and, you know, as we look at our data and we see people adopting more of the best practices that we talk about, what we see is that the worst outcomes really disappear, right? So um, and this is every community that was in Yellowdig as of the time that we did this, this research. Um, and and there, there were no communities that got, you know, truly bad outcomes when they were adopting a lot of our, our practices. Um, and then one more slide here for this. Um, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, you guys tend to be looking at uh, volume or, or quantity, um, but that's not entirely true. And, you know, as we're interacting with our partners, we are highly focused on quality. Um, and these are a couple of slides that partners, um, you know, presented um, without our knowledge. We found out a lot afterwards, but I um, just wanted to give you a sense that, um, you know, our partners are finding that these changes and this system really does improve both the quantity and quality of the responses. Fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, Yellow Dig, a bottom line is Yellow Dig isn't just a pretty discussion board. It is a completely sort of different paradigm of, of, of how to engage and create better conversations and deeper conversations with your students. Um, and again, you know, if you do have any questions, there's a Q&A uh, area that you can um, Post those questions into the chat and, and Janine. Uh -oh. just standing up if this isn't going to work too well. Okay. So we're, we're, we're looking in uh, Yellow Dig now. And, um, you know, I'm assuming that uh, people who are here are 
well familiar with Yellowdig and are using Yellowdig. Um, but we want to talk a little bit now about the data that's available to you in Yellowdig and, and, and how it can, you know, help you uh, know a little bit more about what's going on in your community, about with your students, and, and, and to inform your teaching. So we want to point out to you um, just a number of, of areas in Yellowdig where you can go to find data and maybe how to look at that data as well. Um, we're also going to be talking about how uh, you know you can find those important conversations in in Yellow Dig um, a, a, as you're as you're you know looking for those from your students. And then um, if there's time, we're going to talk a little bit about our API, which is um, application programming interface, which you can use or your data specialist at your school can use to query the Yellow Dig uh, to find out pretty much anything that you would want to know um, based on on the queries that they're able to write. So let's start by pointing out that. Um, on the Yellow Dig sidebar, there's a, 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 a choice here called data. And oddly enough, that's where you would go to find most of the data pieces that you'd need to, to see that are going to be helpful for you. And I'm just going to go through them really quickly. The first one is community health. There's quite a number of uh, variables in there that we're going to show you in just a minute. The points report, the member report, which we're going to spend some time on, and the points report, uh, and then the community report and the network graph. So let's start with community health. And, and show you the plethora of, of things that are available there. We want to start, um, you know, this summary page is a great page to go to, to, to see, you know, some overarching stats about what's happening in your community. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this one in particular, the conversation ratio, but basically it gives you a good overview. Um, the, the activity log, if you're using our, our standard weekly points uh, setup, is going to break down the posts and comments per week. So you can see, you know, have I been consistent in, in my participation? Have my students been consistent in what's going on there? But Brian, let's start by talking about conversation depth and, and why we measure that and what, what's important about it and, 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 and what this number actually means. Yeah, um, in a couple of slides that I showed earlier, this um, you know value was I think um, mentioned or addressed. But uh, essentially, the conversation ratio is just the um, number of comments per post, right? And again, what we find is that as students actually interact more about a post, they uh, you know more students are actually reading the post. They're clicking the hyperlinks that are in the post. You know, they're paying attention and watching the videos. And, and then they're interacting around that, right? And ultimately, I think that's what most people want or expect from a discussion board. And um, what we've essentially found in our own platform is that as this number goes up, almost everything else goes along with it. And that's why we surface it um, as a high level value. Uh, if you think about a standard discussion board that's, you know, uh, post once, comment twice, you get a conversation ratio of two. That is not nearly good enough to have an actual discussion, right? Um, and so one of the things that we're finding is that as we drive this conversation ratio up, everything goes up. And, um, you know, we're finding that a number around eight is actually a pretty good goal. And it's pretty um, readily achievable uh, if you are really sort of encouraging commenting. You know, but if you if you if you use Yellow Dig the same way you'd use a discussion board, and you're telling students to go in and to post once and comment twice, you're still going to get that too. Generally speaking, if you're not allowing them to do anything else, or if it, it, and if they're just in there for the grade and 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 to answer those prompted questions, it's unlikely that you're going to see much improvement in this score. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about is uh, listening and interacting, looking at the interacting and listening that your students are doing. Oops, and I got to click the right button. Here we go. It, in the uh, the second button there, on, I'll just show you at the top here. Summary: Health check. The health check is going to see if you're uh, if you've if you've um, configured your community to meet our our sort of uh, passive best practices. The things that you can enable simply by by the way you set up the community. These these uh, seven points here. Um, you know, those are our passive. Uh, best practices, and you can see the check marks to see whether you're following those or not. But hopefully more valuable is the uh, community health composite scores here below. Brian, can you uh, shed some light on these? Yeah, just very quickly, we basically broke down, um, you know, student behavior into three different buckets, which we thought um, indicated higher listening, higher interacting, higher sharing. 
Um, and this dashboard basically uh, takes the variables beneath uh, those higher level scores and um, creates individual percentile scores for each of those variables. And then the average is the number that you see at the top. So um, in terms of sharing, this is a, a demo community. So these are all pretty poor scores. Um, but, uh, you know, the average percentile for, uh, you know, word count, comments, posts in this community uh, is, is a 14. Behaviors that are associated with students sharing more information uh, in the community. Um, as it turns out, we think that that score is the least important to be high because, um, you know, essentially, if you want students to do more of this, you can just make them have to post more to get their points or whatever. And you can drive the sharing score um, pretty high just by requiring students to do more. The listening and interacting scores are more I, I want to point out that the, the metrics below it changed, Brian, just to, to be clear that you click on these and you get to see the different metrics. Go ahead. Right. Yep. So the listening and interacting scores with the sort of variables underneath of those are more reflective of voluntary behaviors, right? So students actually viewing posts, they don't get points for that, right? They don't have to scroll in Yellowdig when they come to Yellowdig, right? But if they aren't doing those things, they're not really consuming information. They're not listening to what is being shared there. You know, if they're not clicking on hyperlinks in the post, they're not really um, consuming that information. And then interacting scores are mostly around sort of specific student connections, right? Um, and, and giving reactions to one another and, and sort of interacting thoughtfully with one another. So um, as you're thinking about these scores in the platform, uh, what we usually find is that as listening and interacting scores go up, it'll also drive the sharing score up. And, um, and so the, 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 best, the healthiest pattern in a lot of cases is, um, you know, if the listening and interacting score are high, it's okay if the sharing score is a little bit lower. Two, one other quick thing about this, in your own Yellowdig communities, you'll have the ability natively to, to compare your community to all existing other Yellowdig communities. But if, you're, if your school, if your institution has enough Yellowdig communities in their Yellowdig organization, you'll have an opportunity to, to, to click into the particular uh, network and see how your community compares to the others at your institution as well. And, you know, and, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to, Brian, what are some strategies? If, 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 if you found your listening or interacting scores to be lower than you were hoping, what, what are some strategies that you can use to improve those? Yeah, I mean, most often what we recommend in order to get students to come to Yellowdig and really participate thoughtfully is to try to make the community as valuable as, pos valuable as possible to them. And what that often means for me is to think about other things that you can do in Yellowdig that are in addition to the things that you're doing, especially if you are using something that's um, more prompted and more formal, um, you know, sort of assignments. Um, you try to find additional things that you can do to get students to come to Yellowdig, participate, actually interact with one another. I mean, some of those things might even be, you know, creating a no point topic to allow students to have like a coffee house area so that they can interact, you know, outside of earning points or something like that. Um, essentially, a lot of times it's just open the community up a little bit, relax some of the rules around deadlines and, and allow students and encourage students to share their own, their own material, you know, their, their own articles from the, uh, you know, uh, Kind of from happens. related to the course concepts and, and, and their own experiences. And I, I think, um, Brian, you hit on one of the most important things you can do to start your community on the right foot, and that's to set expectations with students, to let them know that Yellow Dig is a little bit different. Tell them why you're doing it. Tell them what they should expect from you and what you are explicitly expecting from them. And uh, our knowledge base has some articles that can help you uh, as far as that goes. Um, so moving on, another piece of, of Yellowdig data that I think is extremely useful and, and, and is why our topics system is, is so valuable is, well, topics. And, um, 
if you have created thoughtful topics in Yellow Dig that that shape the conversations that you want students to be having, um, you know, those top level syllabus subject matter or, or, or just the conversations, the, the words that indicate the conversations that you want to have rather than week one, module two, chapter three, that keeps those all in those weekly buckets and allow those conversations to organically uh, continue, this topic data can show you exactly which of those topics your students are spending the most time on. And you can see that in a global basis. You can see that, uh, you know, that in this particular commu uh, community, a uh, data communication for lay people is at the top of, of, of what students are, are, are communicating in. And you can see general reading, Q&A, electronics, mechanics. And, and, and one of the things that this tells me is a high level is maybe this data communication for lay people might be too broad a topic. Maybe it should be broken down in, into some other areas that, and I'll create, if I were the professor, I might create some subtopics, I shouldn't say subtopics, some additional topics that more gent more helpfully focus the conversations on the minutia of, of that. And that's not only going to make those conversations clearer and easier to find, um, but, it, but it's going to allow students to a little more guidance on, on what it is that you want them to be talking about. In addition to that, we have the ability to look at each individual student in your communities and which topics uh, they're they're uh, con they're contributing on. And Brian, it, it, you know, what's the value in this? Yeah, one of the ways that I like to talk about using this is, um, you know, we know that quite a few of our learners are adult learners that are are you know professionals at something. Um, and and what ha often happens in those types of classes is, you know a student really deeply understands something and is trying to help other students learn it or or really is you know just excited about the topic um and and you know you can use that data to reach out to the student see what you know what they're talking about and and maybe invite them to you know give a little presentation in a synchronous session or you know uh, share something specific about their experience to help build on that part of the conversation and this can help you bring that student up and if you have a synchronous part of your class or something like that and share the conversation that they had or or, or what have you. Um, uh, before you move on, can you sure. go along to the um, topic area up top again? I'm sorry? Can you go to the topic area up top again? I can, yes. One of the things that I think that we hear a lot about when people are sort of considering, you know, sort of opening up their discussions a little bit and, and not prompting students, um, you know, on a weekly basis is that they're they're basically worried that students aren't going to pay attention to the, to most of the topics that they want them to pay attention to. Um, we would recommend generally leaving points on for all of the topics and allowing students to talk about those topics um, as the course goes on. And a lot of times they'll naturally shift along with the topics in the course because it allows them to also blend the topics together. It allows them to do things like um, put both topic tags on and say like, oh, these two things are, you know, it's relevant for both things. Um, that works really well in almost every case. And if you ever need to sort of nudge students on from a topic, the, the best way to do that in Yellowdig is to just turn off the points for that topic, right? And then just inform your students, say, hey, you know, I see you've been talking about data communication for lay people a lot. I'm glad that you guys were really excited about that topic. Um, and you can keep talking about it if you like, but I don't want you to earn points for that one anymore. I'd like to encourage you to, you know, talk about other topics, right? And so then when you turn the points off for that, um, you, you're able to sort of make that informed decision based on the topic data that you have and address that problem of students sort of like getting stuck on something or, or maybe not talking exactly about the things you want. Um, Two. One, one other piece of that is, you know, in the topic selector, you can move these topics around and reorder them. So if you want students to focus more on a specific topic, um, a good way to encourage that is to put those topics that are most currently relevant at the top of that selector. And just one other thing that I would want to add about that, you can do that at any time, you can add new topics at any time. And, um, you know, when, when Brian said keep the topics on and point earning, um, I, I think it's it's important that 
you realize that um, we're talking about the course concept topics here. There are other topics that you can keep using that won't have points associated with them. For example, a class lounge or a Q&A, which can be used again, the Q&A with that course concept topic to give additional context. Um, if people use the, the Q&A topic with points, students are unlikely to add the uh, course concept topic because they're going to get points for just adding the question and it's going to make it a little harder to navigate. So I would encourage that uh, topic to be um, a no top, no point topic as well. Um, all right, Brian. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's, uh, so topics, are, you know, obviously they're really important. You know, one of the things that you want to be able to do in your LED community is, is identify, you know, important student um, behaviors. What's going on? Who who is is contributing to your community the most? Who 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 might need a little push or or is having some sort of issue in there? And there's a number of ways that you can can find some of that right here in Yellowdick. First of all, you know you might want to know: Are your students earning their points? What are we looking at here? Yeah. So this is just a point report, which does what it says, which is you know really give a point breakdown for every student how how close they are to the goal, basically. Um, and, you know, within that, you can do some searching and filtering to make it easier to find specific students. Um, one thing I do like to highlight here is, you know, there are some functions there to be able to, to adjust, um, you know, points for, for students and to, uh, uh, you know, adjust multiple students at the same time if there's something, some reason, uh, you know, you need to to give every student a little bit of credit. Maybe uh, something happens and school closes down for for a couple of days or something. You want to just give them a little bit of a bump, uh, things like that. Uh, you can also, yeah. yeah. You can also see the log of each individual student and what they've actually done in the community. The, this is a demo community, so there's not a lot for us to show you here, unfortunately. Um, but you're gonna be able to see point for point what every student has earned, the link to that post or, or comment or what have you. In fact, let's suppose a student didn't earn any points for a post because they didn't meet the word count. You're still going to be able to see that. That post will be there. It'll say zero points, 39 words, or what have you. And the student has the exact same view, so there should never be any kind of uh, issue between you and the student as far as what they've earned. I also want to... Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to point out the column for last interaction with points um, and just make sure that's clear what, it, what that is. Um, basically, uh, the last interaction with points will, will, will tell you when that student was last in the community and took an action um, on their own that created points, right? So for them, it would be a post or comment um, uh, that earn, that actually earned points. All right. Um, I want to show, you, you may notice it says download detailed points log and download points summary. Um, if I were to click on one of these, and here we go, it's going to take me to a place where I can Actually, it'll download a CSV file, which maybe you can see right here before. And then you can open that up in, uh, you know, your your spreadsheet of choice, in this case, Excel, um, and, and, and manipulate that data in, in a way that makes sense to you. I'm going to show you uh, really quickly. Uh, so here is the detailed point overview, which is going to show you each learner, the week, the action, and the points they earn for it with a link to each and every post. So it's it's sort of a, a, a way that you have more control and sorting ability and all that kind of stuff through that. Um, and, and the same goes for the uh, other points report, which is the uh, point summary, which I think I forgot to activate. Sorry about that. Um, but it's, that's one that's uh, also easy to do. But the, but the report that I think we want to spend a little bit more time on is the member report. Member report, again, you can go here into data, click member report, and then if you want to generate that report to see it in the platform, you just click that. It's going to take a second or two to generate it because there's a lot of data there. And you can you can use the report right in, in Yellowdig, but I think you're going to have a better experience if you download it as a CSV. And then, um, for example, you can open it up and, and really get a good example of all the data uh, in here. And, and Brian, what, what are some of the key pieces of data that you'd want to point out here? Yeah, I think that there's a few ways that you can use this report to focus your attention a little bit. Um, uh, 
the, 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 one of the variables that I like most is to pay attention to students' individual um, ratio of, of posts to comments, which you can easily do with this report. If you see a student that is only posting um, and they're really not interacting with students, that is a student that I would want to reach out to and, and you know, first of all, see what they're doing in the community, um, but also try to encourage them to actually connect with other students. When we look at student, um, uh, you know, completion of courses or continuation to the next semester, uh, it's pretty clear as day that um, there are there are some students that will participate, but they're not interacting with other students, and those students I, I, I tend to be the most in danger of dropping the course or or not continuing on to the next semester. Um, and, and it's because those connections with other people and actually interacting and talking about this stuff um, definitely helps learning. It also helps various sort of um, belonging and, and mental health uh, sorts of things, I, I believe. Um, but, but look for that. Um, one of the other things I would look for is, is you know, what we termed um, or, or I should say one of our, our, our clients actually um, was talking with us about this in terms of orphan posts. Um, but essentially, if a student is creating a whole bunch of posts that nobody is responding to, uh, they will have a lot of orphan posts. So an orphan post is just a post that somebody created that nobody is responding to. First of all, you don't want to have very many of these in your community overall. So if you're seeing a lot of them, um, you know, it's probably an indication that you need to encourage a little bit more interacting. But if an individual student is creating a lot of posts that nobody is responding to, um, and again, if nobody's sort of interacting with them, um, a lot of times it's an indicator that they're just not uh, really like grasping the task where they're not really sharing high quality material. So it can be a good way to, um, you know, figure out and, and look at those students a little more deeply and, and figure out uh, what might be going on. By the way, <clears throat> by the way, if if you do see a student that has a number of orphan posts and you check them out, and 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 generally, as Brian said, the the cause is going to be that they're not creating valuable content for for the community. But if you do see, hey, this is a reasonable post. This is a worthwhile post. As an instructor, what can you do, Brian? Yeah, there's a couple of things you can do. I would recommend um, if it's exceptional, put an accolade on it. Um, and when you put an accolade on a post, it pops it back to the top of the community, right? So if a, if a really good post got ignored in your community and you notice it a little bit farther down the feed and, and you're like, well, I wanted my students to all see this, um, an accolade is a good way to send it back to the top and sort of give it another chance for everybody to, to make, you know, interact with it. Um, or, you know, create a comment and say something that extends the conversation, right? So don't say good post. Uh, because that honestly kills conversation in a lot of cases. Just sort of going around and saying "good post, good post" is is not an effective strategy for getting students to interact more. What you're going to want to do is, you know, ask a question that builds off of what they wrote. They'll know you read it, and 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 they'll either answer it or another student will answer it. Um, but but you know, ask a question that extends that conversation. Um, one of the, my favorite things is to mention another student that maybe was talking about a similar topic or had a similar idea or an idea that dovetailed into the original post and sort of link those students up by at mentioning the other students to take a look at. Bottom line is if you take action on an orphan post, it's going to rise to the top of the feed and the rest of your students are going to see it. Um, you know, but it's not about the bottom of the of the class. You can also see, you know, who is the students who are getting the most accolades? Who are the students who are, are contributing the most, commenting on other people's posts? This is really valuable data. And, and, and sometimes it might be worthwhile sharing some of it in a synchronous session. You know, so-and-so is doing a, such a great job here or, or, or what have you. And uh, there's a lot of ways that you can leverage that. And again, that is the member report um, in the other day. And let me just switch back to screens. And, and, and you know, now, um, any questions about those reports before we move on? I think we we could probably take one or two if there if there was any. Uh, I'm trying to get back to my. There we're we we're doing good. You're uh, you're actually talking about some of the questions in such as ideas for managing or helping with orphan posts. So that's one thing that's come up. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Um. <clears throat> so, you know. 
one of the things, and, and, and while this isn't numerical data, it is data, you know, identifying, finding important conversations in the community itself. You know, as an instructor, you you want to, we, we would never generally recommend that you need to read every post and every comment in Yellow Dig. But the conversations that are occurring in Yellow Dig, they're not in a vacuum. They can be valuable to other parts of your course. And, and you want to maybe make sure that those important conversations get in front of your students. And you can, you know, when you find those, those important conversations, you could, you know, copy the permalink and put it into your learning management system to direct people to that conversation. Or you could pull it up in a synchronous, a live synchronous session of your conversation or something like that. But Brian, how would you find those you know, what are some, I mean, I've got some ideas myself, frankly, but um, just uh, do you have uh, some thoughts on how maybe an instructor can best find some of those valuable conversations? I'll probably have my own. Taste. Yeah, um, the one that just pops to my mind is to use the sort function on the on the feed, right? So by default, Yellowdix feed is organized so that um, uh, what is at the top is any you know new conversation, any new post that was created, um, or a post that has recently gotten a comment, right? So every time that a post gets a comment um, or an accolade from an instructor, it will pop back to the top of the feed. And what that means is obviously as students are coming into the community, they're seeing those conversations that are the newest or the most active and relevant to the audience, to the students, right? So um, that that default sorting strategy is is a big way that that we figured out how to sort of uh, keep students focused on the content that really matters most at that point in the course. Um, but there are other uh, ways to sort that, and one of them is by active posts. And what that does, um, each post uh, and comment gets an activity score um, that is you know, related to how many reactions it has, how many views it has, how much students have commented on it. And so those um, uh, those things that pop to the top in that sorting are those uh, conversations that have gotten the most action, basically. Um, so it's a good way to identify content that the community is, is really interested in and engage with. And as far as informing your teaching, um, you know, you can, highlight those conversations in a synchronous session, maybe you, you, um, you can pull a permalink from one of these posts uh, and share it in, in a digest or another you know, part of the course if you wanna draw even more attention to it. Um, but, but those things can really help you identify content maybe um, that you wanna focus on the next time you run the course or something like that as well. You know, a couple other ways that you can sort of um, find those good conversations. First of all, if you've awarded an accolade, those are probably good conversations. So they're all going to be right here for you as well. Um, what about, you know, using, uh, what if you wanted to find a particular good conversation on a particular topic, Brian? What would you suggest? Um, you can always filter by topic. So the, feed, the whole feed will filter by topic. If you click on one of those topic tags or, or go to the filter area. So um, I would assume most people probably know about that, but um, that's one reason that we recommend being thoughtful about those topic tags as you're setting them up. Um, the, 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 the search is also really um, pretty good and robust. So you can put most things in the search and, and it'll return uh, the results you want. Um, and if you also want to find uh, something that is specifically a post or comment, that search interface um, makes it really easy to uh, flip between. And I want to point out that what we're looking at right now is for, and, and there's nothing here, I didn't find any comments as far as that goes, that under the word, that have the word game in them that are under the thinking and learning uh, topic. And uh, you can, you can you know, drill down, you could have add, you know, specific uh, student or um, within a date range or something like that as well. And all, the, all of the filters add on top of one another to increasingly drill down. Uh, so if you're ever seeing something like this with a completely blank feed, uh, check that you don't have a, a filter enabled uh, that might be, you know, causing it to not return it. Yeah, there we go. And um, by the way, when you do this sort, um, when you're looking at the sort, it's only going to affect your feed. You 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 can't make it so that you set your feed to show recent posts only, and your students are going to see the same thing. Um, but your students have this ability as well to to to, to do that. 
Um, before we move on, I want to uh, address uh, the, 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 the one question that is in the Q&A that I see now, if that's all right. <clears throat> oh, and you said you were going to answer it live. I was going to. Well, you go ahead, Bob, because I, I want to see well, we how both your do it. Mine. <laughs> What's your recommended instruction to students for doing online discussion? I see the problem with posts once, reply twice, but don't know a good alternative. If I give abstract instructions, most students will have anxiety. They want to know exactly what to do. I'm going to let you start that off and I'll add flavor if I can. Yeah. So, um, you know, our general recommendation is to provide instructions to the students to, you know, share things that they find in their daily lives um, or, you know, in current events in the news, um, you know, or questions that they have about a homework assignment or, um, you know, something they didn't understand from lecture that they, you know, need some clarification on. If you invite students to do all of those things, um, they will tend to come to the community, start participating to try to get their points. And what will ultimately happen is they'll share information and have interactions that um, really help them see the value in participating in this community, right? If I'm a student and I can come here and I can talk about things that I think are interesting from the news, or I can you know, ask a question about something I really need the answer to, I'm gonna value coming to Yellow Day. And if other students are coming there and they're helping me, um, or the instructor is coming there and helping me, I'm gonna find that to be a help in my education, not really a hindrance. And you know, students definitely participate more under those conditions. Um, you know, as far as the abstract instructions, I think that there's you know a couple of important things you can do to, to head that problem off and head off student anxiety about that. Um, Bob showing one of them, uh, which is a video introduction script. Um, uh, you know, it, it sort of set expectations for students clearly is, is one recommendation. That definitely helps uh, anybody that does have any anxiety about this. Um, and being really clear about those expectations helps make them comfortable. The other thing that we always recommend is modeling to students um, pretty much exactly how you want them to behave, right? So you would not want a student to come into the community and tell, you know, and put in a prompt and, and, and tell every student that they have to answer their prompt or something like that, right? What you would want students to do is come in and share an interesting news article or something they were reading in a journal and say, hey guys, like I was reading this, thought this was really interesting, wanted to share it. You know, here's a couple of specific things that I thought were noteworthy from this. What do you think, right? Basically model exactly how you would want students to create posts um, uh, and, and, and tell them, this is what I want you to do. And that helps a lot as well. Yeah, and you know, again, um, as I think you mentioned earlier, Brian, um, we we know our data shows that the instructor commenting in 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 the community is much more valuable to the community as a whole rather than than starting posts all the time. However, when you're starting your community, showing students exactly what you want is a great way to do it to 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 give those exemplar posts of hey, you know, when I was uh, come, you know learning to do whatever my role is to become a subject matter expert in this thing, this is what I did and it was, you know, helpful to me or something like that and share or sharing an article or sharing an experience or something like that. That's going to give them your, your your role is to model behavior so model the behavior you want to see and your students will follow along as far as that goes. I hope that uh, helps answer that question. And I just wanted to point out um, when you're creating that getting started uh, sort of setting expectations um, video, which we encourage you to do in the platform rather than putting a huge block of text in your LMS or your syllabus so that students will actually pay attention to it. You can do that by clicking the record button right in Yellow Dig, and it'll allow you to create a 90 second video, very easy to do. I would also recommend that you use a no point topic when you as the instructor post to disincentivize students from replying to your posts and, 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 and rather encouraging them to start their own conversations about whatever the, the topic is. I want to quickly address a um, question by Melanie that was in the chat. It says, our profs usually use module titles as topics. Is there another practice we should know? Um, 
the the short answer or or, or what we usually say about topics is this um uh if you're going to use module titles use the actual titles the actual um uh the the topic name right so if i was teaching a, a course on psychology like this one i might use intrinsic motivation as the topic extrinsic motivation as another topic right our, our major recommendation on the names of topics is to not use uh, time markers in them, like um, just using module one or just using week two or something like that. Um, and there's a couple of important reasons for that. First of all, students don't remember when they're in week four what week two was. So if you really want them to ever go back to that conversation, you know, they're going to forget what week two was they're not going to forget what intrinsic motivation was, hopefully. Um, the, the other reason is that if you put those time delineated markers into the topics, we find that students start to only use one topic at a time. They'll never blend topics. And they will also tend to treat it like a weekly assignment. So they'll say, I just need to talk about this topic this week. And they'll make sure they come in before the rollover, but they 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 don't think of it as much as a rolling conversation. They tend to think of it more as a check the box. I do. I just have to do this once a week. So anything that you can do in your course design to discourage that thought for students will generally yield better outcomes, right? We don't want them thinking about this as something they only do once a week because if they only do it once a week, they're not really going to be able to have robust conversations with other people. One, one other thing about topic names is that, you know, when you're posting, when, when there are posts in Yellow Dig, that's the first thing anyone sees. Knowing what the actual words are that describe that gives that context to show you what that post is about. And, and as a student, if I see module two, I don't know that I'm necessarily interested in module two. If I see thinking language and intelligence, oh yeah, that's something that I want to engage with. Um, you know, I, I have a thought about that. I have a question that I, I, I want to answer out of it. And, and again, if you encourage your students, and I highly advise this, to ask all of their course questions in Yellow Dig and then go ahead and try to answer your peers' questions about that, and you have that concept label on the topic itself, students are going to know whether or not they have the capability of answering that question. Module two doesn't tell me, can I answer that question or not? Thinking, learning, and intelligence, or thinking language and intelligence, maybe I can. Maybe I'll take more of a shot at it doing that way. Um, hope that helps uh, for everyone who asks those questions. Are there, uh, we have one more thing that we need to cover, and we have a, a short amount of time, and that is the Yellow Dig API. Um, Brian, can you, and I'm trying to get to the screen, um, while I'm doing that, can you uh, tell us what uh, what the API is and, and, and why somebody might be interested in it? Yeah, I forgot we were going to talk about this, but it is important. <laughs> um, uh, for anybody um, that doesn't know what an API is, in, in short, it's basically a way for um, users to query our database fairly directly, right? So. Um, uh, each person can generate an API key inside of the platform. And once you have that API key, it will allow you to access any data that you should have access to um, for any courses that you taught, or if you're an admin, the ability to uh, query across you know, your whole organization. Um, but basically, this API allows you to put in a couple of variables and receive data back. Um, within our documentation, you can play around with it um, yourself uh, with just um, uh, putting putting it directly into this website. Um, for anybody that, that might be a data scientist or, or, or somebody that wants to create um, dashboards in your own institution, um, you can set those up using the API and, uh, and, and, and be able to um, get all kinds of information out of that. Um, this API is, is sort of like everything from click level data. Basically, any event that happens in Yellow Dig um, can come out of the API. We also have specific APIs to um, uh, measure basically attendance events. When was the last event for any member? When was the earliest event for any member to see sort of when they started as well? So there's there's a bunch of different capabilities within this API. If any of that sounds interesting to you, we're more than happy to 
you know, help help your organization or help you use it. A lot of our researchers are using this to be able to get their data out of our system in a, um, you know, in a uh, format that's more readily uh, tied into different statistics packages and things like that. We, we've seen some amazing uh, visualizations come from this, um, amazing questions. In fact, we have uh, one, one uh, client who um, used it to uh, look at, at foreign language. It was a, a, a teaching foreign languages class, and they were able to use the API to spot Google Translate um, or, or you know, automated translations versus student translations, uh, among other things. Just, just one, one example of that. Yeah, and I'm never promising that we can extend the API for, for every single thing, but we have had researchers um, ask us to include additional pieces of data. Uh, for example, how different posts and comments relate to one another so that um, they could do a better job of sort of mapping the network connections and things like that. So uh, if there's ever anything that you find a need for in there um, or, or your teams or, or your university, um, we're definitely open to continuing to work with people on, on, on improving that more and more. Now, we only have a, a few minutes left. Um, I, I'm willing to stick around a little bit. Uh, I assume Brian is as well. Um, but we would be happy to take any more questions that you might have at this point. Or, or, or Janine, is there anything that we did not pick up in, in, in the chat or Q&A that we haven't addressed yet? I, I think there is one question that would be useful to talk about. And that is the question about when working with faculty, thinking about how they use module topics and include module discussion prompts. I just wanted to get your clarity on that, just to make sure that, uh, yeah. that's clear. Yeah, so I tried to answer a little bit of that earlier with sort of talking about topics and how to name them. So. Um, if they are doing that, definitely don't just use module one and, and, and uh, or week one or whatever as, as the topic name. Um, you know, at a really high level, given the data I sort of started out presenting, my, my answer to them would be, to, you know, to try to work with them to think about ways that they can relax that structure as much as they're possibly comfortable with. Because um, as they do that, I think they will start to see the improvements and outcomes that they're, that that a lot of people are hoping to see, um, you know, as they sort of adopt new technologies or are trying to to really solve you know a, a problem that they're seeing with their current discussions. The long and short of it to me is that the discussion framework has certain things about it that really hurt student engagement. There is a deadline at the end of every week. Students know that they can get their points if they just wait until the deadline. And by the way, if nobody's in early in the week to actually have conversations with, you really can't have interactions. So students actually learn to procrastinate more under that model uh, as the course goes on. Uh, whereas, you know, in Yellowdig, if they're if they're not uh, having specific deadlines that they have to meet, there's 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 nothing to procrastinate. Too. So they interact more regularly throughout the weeks. All right. Um, yeah, got I say, Bob responded more to that. Some of these things, I think, you know, uh, might require a little bit more conversation depending on what they're exactly trying to achieve and how we think that we can um, achieve that goal um, with some rethinking. Yep. So uh, Melanie's topic, organizational management, sounds like a good topic. Um, just at the, uh, you know, depending on the conversations and how much time you're spending on it, that 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 could even be a broad, uh, an over broad con uh, topic. You might want to narrow that down to different types of organizational management, so students can drill down to find, you know, this type of management versus that type of management. So uh, you know, you you'll be able to see in that topic data how they're how they're doing on that one as well. One thing that, that I've noticed as an observation as I work with instructors and designers is a lot of people worry that when you give students a little bit more freedom, that they're not going to use it responsibly, for lack of a better way of saying it. We find it's almost always the opposite, and that if you empower students to make choices about where they can participate and add value to the conversation, and you give them some options to choose, you know, 
uh, what topics they think are interesting to bring in from the outside, from the news or whatever. If you open up the possibilities for students and give them a little bit of freedom, in a lot of cases, they, they really start doing the things that you've wanted them to do all along. And, and just one caveat to that is, that doesn't mean not being in the community. You still need to be there, and 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 that's what's going to make those great conversations uh, occur. I notice we're we're just a minute over time, and appreciate everyone who joined us today. Um, and we understand certainly if you have to take off, but we're having fun, so we'll stick around if there are any more questions. And again, if you're if you're taking off, thank you so much. Um, and uh, please let us know either in the comments here or via email to uh, bob at yellowdig.com or any of us um, your thoughts on this session, what other types of sessions you might want to see, and uh, if, if you found this to be worthwhile or not. So uh, again, for everyone who's taken off, thank you so much for coming.